Welcome to week five of HI3284. And this week we get a little bit morbid. We're dealing with cemeteries. Cemeteries are an interesting thing to include in this subject because they are a text that we can read and they also have associated records. In terms of reading cemeteries as a text, the set reading should help you and you've been asked to go on a tour of a cemetery near you in your own time instead of come to tutorial this week. So I'd like you to look through the readings list, look at that guide to cemeteries in your local area or find another if I haven't got your local area included and go and have a look around. I realize it may not be possible for everyone to get themselves to a cemetery. If that's the case, let me know and think about what you can do instead that's relevant and that will give you material to talk about in the tutorial in week six. So as I say, we're looking at cemeteries and we're looking at cemeteries in terms of how they help historians. Cemeteries are interesting texts. They contain traces of ordinary lives and there are those associated records, associated death records, which catch everyone in a society. They tell us more though, we can read them as well in terms of texts about communities and texts about officialdom and control of human remains. They are a trace of people's own lives, of families' responses to death. They're a trace as well of the built environment and they're a trace of emotional history and how people at various times have thought about death. So it's perhaps a little bit of a difficult topic, but it's a very interesting one. I include cemeteries in this subject because I'm aware that the topic is popular with students. I don't work with cemeteries. I visit them occasionally out of interest in various places, but they're not something I use as a primary source. Other historians do, and I know that students in the subject are often intrigued by the possibilities that cemeteries present, and so it's worth spending a week thinking about them. And historians do use them, and cemeteries provide us with records of people who might not leave other traces, which makes them very popular with family historians. If you can read a cemetery, there's a whole lot of information there. Death records have particular written details, and they're often associated with cemeteries. But the graves as well carry information. Grave markers, the style of grave markers, can carry information about social standing, beliefs, and social connections. And that's before you even get to reading the text. In addition, family historians like cemeteries because of that emotional engagement, that sense that they've found their lost relative, they've found their ancestor, and they are connected in some way. This means that there's a whole genre of books exploring graves and the stories of people who occupy them. If you go to city libraries in Townsville, there are certainly a few of these books on the shelf there. And if you go and look in Trove, there's about 2,000 of them. That's a slight exaggeration. You can see I've done a Trove search. And you can see there's a genre of popular history. Galtz and Adams seem to be building a publishing empire built on graveyards. They're not alone. Family historians, popular historians, like the texts that graveyards represent, and they use them to tell the types of stories they want to tell. Graveyards are also useful to academic historians. I mentioned Geoffrey Rice and his work on the 1918 influenza pandemic in New Zealand a couple of weeks ago. He didn't work from the cemeteries themselves, instead he worked from death records. But cemeteries also tell us about pandemics. And I don't think I need to tell you how cemeteries might tell us about pandemics. They tell us about other medical issues as well. Are there a whole lot of graves of women of childbearing age? Are there a whole lot of child graves? And as a result, they can be quite touching. They can also be misleading. I've included a link on the slide to an article about the grave markings of people who died from the 1918-1920 flu pandemic in Australia. And in it, Peter Hobbins argues that the graves of flu victims 
don't tell you that. Don't tell you that they died from the flu. Which shows that graves on their own can be misleading. Again, you've got to have the triangulation and the secondary sources to support you in your analysis. Cemeteries carry information beyond the stories of individuals. They have been used by historians to construct histories of stonemasonry and to analyse a specialisation of grave marker production. Historians have looked at the history of churchyards, including how the resources in graveyards get reused. Gravestones have been reused as paving stones, and it, it took a movement in the 1970s in Britain to preserve churchyards, to stop this recycling of the resources that they contained. And in the reading this week, you can see too how cemeteries can be used as a way to study urban development and social change that is taking place. Cemeteries are interesting resources. They're resources not just about the individuals who are buried there, and the individuals are important, and when you visit your cemetery, I would like you to be respectful, but the information in the graveyards extends beyond that, and it can tell you about the society that they were part of. And cemeteries are an important part of cityscapes. Old cemeteries are often found in prime real estate because they were established as the cities were established as towns. The placement of cemeteries and the awkward placement of cemeteries can be clear signs of how a city has grown and perhaps grown unexpectedly. In addition, grave markers, so stories about people, can be used to commemorate community progress. So you have graves of the first settler in this region, marked as such, the grave site itself becomes a site of not just the individual, but of community and of the community's progress. And sometimes these grave sites become tourist attractions because of their significance to the community at large, not just to the family. In our region, our region being North Queensland and beyond that, Australia, European style cemeteries are relatively recent. A lot of the material around cemeteries and how to use cemeteries is about places where cemeteries have a longer history. So in Europe, where there are cemeteries that are centuries old or older. In the United States, where they can certainly date back centuries. Even Australia's oldest cemeteries are younger than that, but they still tell us useful things. Early Sydney had deaths before it had graveyards. As a result, there are possibly burials at Dawes Point for sailors and by Clarence Street military barracks in the city. Before the establishment of cemeteries or before the establishment of towns, there are also burials on stations and in other places close to where a person's death occurred. And for this early period of Australian history, graves themselves are important records because it was only in 1856 that New South Wales began to effectively record births, deaths, and marriages. Before the state took on those roles, church registers were the only source of that information, and church registers require clergy. Graves may be the only marker of a life. In places where the state doesn't record births, deaths, and marriages, and where the clergyman isn't visiting. Despite this late intrusion of the state into keeping these records, interest in graveyards is a bit earlier. Governor Macquarie was important in establishing cemeteries in Australia, and he proclaimed six burial grounds in 1811. He planned them, and that planning is significant in telling us how that society interacted with ideas about life and death. The six burial grounds planned by Governor Macquarie had panoramic views, they were in pleasant places, and they were highly visible reminders to the living of religion and of death. Macquarie also proclaimed that burials on private land were to cease. But it didn't happen because it's not really feasible in Australia at that point. Remote rural dwellers can't bring their dead to town to bury them. And this proclamation of cemeteries in pleasant places is all very well, but it's not really sustainable. Sydney's first burial ground was converted to 
the town hall, in 1869. Not all the human remains there were successfully transferred and reinterred. During works in 1871, in 1888, in the 1890s, in 1904, in 1924, and five more times up to 2007, work on the town hall unearthed human remains. The burial ground that became the town hall was replaced by the Devonshire Street Cemetery. The Devonshire Street Cemetery is now the location of Sydney's Central Railway Station. Camperdown Cemetery was consecrated in 1849. If you look in that image on the top left, you can see a church. But that church was only put up a few decades after that consecration and actually arrived after the cemetery around it was already full. And the area in that image has largely been resumed, all but four acres of it, and converted to parkland. That occurred in 1948. Because these areas that were picked out as cemeteries are now prime real estate close to the city centre of Sydney. The cemetery here has not been converted to buildings. Instead, it's now an off-leash dog park and a remnant native grassland. And this is one of the problems with cemeteries as historical texts. They have a tendency to get overwritten. In England, there used to be a rotating system of burial so that land could be reused, so it wasn't locked up forever. That came to an end when grave markers became elaborate and enduring, and so the rotation simply couldn't occur. As a result, cemeteries started to fill up, and since the 19th century, that's caused problems with land being locked away and communities being forced to find new sites for their dead. We'll come in a moment to that idea of societies and their dead. We'll just note here that grave sites are seen as important, that we do treat them with care. And treating the dead with care is gaining in significance in post-colonial society. Archaeologists at present seem to spend quite a bit of time locating graves for communities. They quite enjoy doing it. They see it as an opportunity to use ground-penetrating radar. They see it as locating important sites of cultural heritage. But they also see it as a sense of giving back to the community and of fulfilling their obligation to the dead. The obligation to the dead is something that archaeologists need to consider, particularly in Australia, where there are a lot of dead and in the past couple of decades, there have been a fair few discussions about what is due to those dead. On the slide are links to resources about consideration of obligations to the dead. There are obligations to the very long dead, particularly with discussions about Mungo Man and Mungo Lady and what should happen to those remains. Those remains are important in rewriting the prehistory of Australia. They pushed Aboriginal occupation back tens of thousands of years and they were important in recognizing that long-term human presence in Australia but what to do with those remains themselves they were after all human beings and they're spiritually important to the people living in that region and this consideration of Australia's deep past also means that in the present we must consider the due recognition of sacred sites, some of which are associated with human remains or associated with beliefs about tending to the borderline between life and death. As a historian, I'm aware of these things, but I tend to leave the process of dealing with them to the archaeologists and the anthropologists. I'm more interested in the treatment of the more recent dead and human remains from the more recent past. And it's something that is very much in the news in the present. Colonial Europeans had a habit of collecting the body parts of other groups of people. There are many human remains in museum collections around the world. And Australia in particular was a source of human remains for scientists who wanted to consider the deep past and who thought that looking at Aboriginal people in Australia would open a window on human evolution. Australia is not the only colonised society that has 
these issues coming out. New Zealand as well as reclaiming human remains from museum collections and finding ways to treat them appropriately and with respect. And it's an issue for pretty much everywhere that was colonised by Europeans in the 19th century. Certainly parts of Africa are also dealing with the return of human remains from museum collections across Europe. This process of return highlights the significance of cultural reactions to death and to human remains. And we shouldn't think of it as something that belongs only to certain groups of people. When you go and look at your modern graveyard, you will see aspects of culture around death. There are different styles of commemoration and it's worth looking for them. There's variation in the treatment of grave sites between different ethnic groups and different religious denominations. That's visible in graveyards and you'll be able to see it and learn about the society that created that graveyard. Looking at graves can tell you what groups of people have been present in a region and how visible they were in those settlements. Overseas, the study of the use of Welsh, the Welsh language, on gravestones has been a way for historians to pick up who was present and how much the Welsh language was part of their identity. And I promise to return to the emotional significance of graveyards and of treatment of the dead. And considering war memorials is a useful way to get us to those ideas. The second reading brings war memorials into discussion as empty tombs. And again, it raises interesting questions about the architecture of grief. So what resources do communities expend commemorating their dead? And how significant are actual human remains to mourning? These questions are useful in problematizing our approach to graveyards and to commemoration of our dead, because they tend to bring it home that it's not just other people who have ideas about what should be done around death, it's our own society as well. And it's something we'll return to in the subject when we consider monumental history. But this is about where I'm going to end up, because you're going to go and put some of these ideas into practice by going on your own field trip to a cemetery, and we'll talk about it in tutorial next week. So you can go and have a look, and you can consider what the layout of the cemetery tells you. What does it tell you about distinctions that continue into death? Not all the real estate in a burial ground is equally prestigious. This is something to keep an eye on. How close are graves? How easily accessible are graves to the living? A good grave site is close to a path. The social distinctions are also recognised in the size of the grave, whether the grave is shared, in the depth of the burial, in the drainage associated with the site, and then in more obvious things such as gravesite decoration, Social distinctions may blur after death because of the desire of people to give their loved ones a good send-off. And the details of giving a loved one a good send-off differ between different groups of people, which means that cemeteries can also tell you about ethnic divisions and about community organisations. So please, make an effort to go to a cemetery in the readings list for this week, there are guides to where cemeteries are located. And I've also put a couple of links to videoed visits to cemeteries in case you really cannot make it to a cemetery near you. Make it to some sort of cemetery, if at all possible, and be prepared to discuss it in tutorial next week.